Hello, hello, hello. What is going on? Welcome. Getting into fall. Starting to feel it. All right, everybody. Here is the drill. Just put questions in the comment section and I will do my best to answer them. And if I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. Don't know everything. <laughs> That's the truth. All right, let's start off here. We've got Anthony. Anthony, welcome. What vocal techniques do you recommend for someone who wants to have a consistent yodel, even when they go down to lower baritone notes? Or how to carry girth up from your baritone? Hold on, let me, let me unpack this. What vocal, sounds like there's a couple questions here. What do I recommend for someone who wants to have a consistent yodel even when they go down to lower baritone notes or how to carry girth up from your baritone? So I'm thinking you're talking about two different things. You're talking or you're asking about um, how to break into your upper register. Some people will talk it in terms of mode M1 um, where you have more of the vocal fold mass vibrating and then M2 where just the the outer layer is vibrating, and there's also an acoustic element to that. I, I don't know if there's a one particular technique. Yeah, I mean, good vocal technique is is going to it should enable you to do what it is that you want to do, and just the key is just to do it in a in a healthy, safe, repeatable manner. Um, but what I would do if look if you want to have a yodel, the easiest way to practice that is practice going from, from wider, more open vowels to more closed, closed vowels, like a to u, a, e. And what's going to happen is that's going to create, create a change in the resonances of the voice and how they align with the, the sound wave. So, a, u, a, u, a, e, a, e, a, e. And um, even if you want to do that down lower, that gets a little trickier. A, u, uh, um, it's going to, when you do a yodel on a lower note and when you go to the, a more falsetto sound on a lower note, it's going to have less acoustic energy. The reason that the high notes can have more energy is the note itself, the pitch that you're on, is higher and higher pitches vibrate faster. And so those faster vibrations have more acoustic energy and they're going to they're gonna carry and they're going to cut. So there's that. Now, if you want to carry how to um, carry girth up from your baritone. So let's talk about what girth is because we don't want to yell, right? That's when we go into the, the shouting yelling mechanism. Um, I mean, there, there are ways that you can do it where it's definitely safer. Um, but for most singers, especially as they're developing, if they go into that shout too hard, there's going to be a couple of factors going on. Acoustically, they're going to be pulling up from the bottom. And then, so the, the acoustic alignment is going to try and push this, this lower resonance too high. And the way that we push that resonance as high as we can is we spread our mouth, drop our jaw, and we also squeeze at the throat. And then this squeezing at the throat, um, very often the, the mechanism of the vocal cords, it's just too heavy. And so it starts to take more pressure to get them to open and close. So you start having to shove more air, which causes us to muscle up. And so you start really banging those vocal folds together. I mean, your, your vocal folds or vocal cords are opening and closing hundreds of times per second. Imagine clapping like this or clapping really hard like that hundreds of times a second. This, your hands are going to get sore pretty quick. And when we irritate the vocal folds, they swell. And then the swelling, now we're dealing with the issues of it's going to take more muscle to get them up to pitch because now they're thicker and fatter, just like a guitar string. It takes more tension to get that guitar string up to pitch. Um, and certain acoustic guitars they warn you that you can't use heavy gauge strings on the guitar because it will put too much 
load on the guitar and you can damage it. Same thing with your voice. Now, having said that, if you want more intensity, bringing your chest voice up, um, you can allow the valve to open up a little bit. I would, I would approach this from the lighter side coming in. So if you're bringing your chest voice up, maybe just starting with and then adding a little more you can open a little more and then as you do it a little higher work on bringing more and more in once you get to about this f sharp above middle c most male voices you you want to be careful about being completely in chest i mean you're you're already going to start to be a little overloaded by then so it's really good to work exercises on mix where you can start to blend towards your head voice um this this idea of blending the two together there's debates on how that really happens that's fine. Singers experience this. And I would be I would be careful to dismiss mix. Mix can be really intense. Mix can be really loud. So um, I would I would work on mix. This is something in my um, voice school um, that I have where we I have a whole course on mix and and I really, really drill singers on mix and I give them feedback and et cetera. All right. Um, hello, singer. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to, Shalian, I'm going to mispronounce your name. I'm so sorry. Can you tell me, uh, warmups for intermediates? That's a very good question. So the difference between warmups for, um, intermediates and beginners, it's not a huge, um, jump. You're, you're actually, um, just going to be more efficient at it. You're going to be better at it. And the true warm-up phase. So I differentiate warming up the voice and then working the voice in a practice session. So the warm-up phase doesn't need to be that long. They've, they've done some studies and they think five minutes is maybe all you need, 10 minutes at most. Um, I don't even think you need that much. If your voice is healthy, if your voice is if you're not feeling well, but you have to sing and the voice is, is puffy and rough, you may have to do a little bit more warming up. The warm up phase uh, for me usually progresses from um, semi occluded vocal tract exercises, SOVT. It's a really fancy way of saying partially blocked exercises. Those can be the lip bubble, the tongue trill. You're, you're just putting a little bit of, of obstruction. You can use uh, the straws. I like this Dr. Vox lately. Um, so you go from the semi-occluded, then you can go to um, narrow, extra narrow vowels, light. Or keeping that G a little dopey. Not going to sing there ultimately, but that just helps me relax and stabilize the larynx. It gets the vocal folds phonating, vibrating without a lot of intensity. <laughs> then I may use um, some other exaggerated sounds, maybe um, little edgy twangy sounds. Um, this one I get from Carrie Obert, but doing like a little kitten. Just do that gently as you come back into chest. Don't slam it to the lower notes. Meow, meow, meow. You're not going meow, meow. And what you're doing is you're just starting to work the edges of the vocal folds, the vocal cords coming together a little more intensely. And there I just start to then gently transition out um, into more finished sounds, sounds that we're going to sing with. I love boop, 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 boop. You can, you can mix and match those. Here's one I get um, from a voice teacher friend of mine, Jeff Alani Stanfield, who 
who's fantastic. And he will just, on a gentle sound, and you just walk that very, very gently with that little edge. And the idea is to be able to just blend smoothly back and forth. That's a little bit more of an advanced exercise. Then you can start taking the, the little K sound away. And just just work on that on that blend back and forth. When I look at uh, rock singers that have insane rages in both their chest, voice, and falsetto, which do you feel have the least repeatable vocals? So that's an interesting question. So the voice has a genetic component. We've all been given an instrument by nature that is going to give us certain advantages and certain disadvantages. And, and we, can, we can work our voice to really start to reach its full potential, but we're ultimately going to have limits in our voice. And there are people who are hyper, they have hyper mobility. They, these are people, for example, they can bend their arm past here yeah they can do those those crazy acrobatic tricks and and twisting and there are people that have hyper mobility in their voice and and they can just have these crazy wild ranges um so there is that now there is a theory that people with hyper mobility they may start to lose that as they get older um i've heard some suggestions that they may start to experience vocal deterioration earlier. I don't know if that's true. Um, there's also, it, it really just depends on their technique. Um, those that are doing intense um, singing, there is, there is a genetic component, right? When we talk about the vocal folds under stress and they start to swell, there is a percentage of the population where the, the cells of the body don't respond to that stress. The same. Some people have more sensitive voices and the swelling happens faster than we have people in the average. And then we have people where the swelling doesn't really happen. So they can experience more stress on their vocal folds than others. I mean, there is a genetic component to this. Um, so people, I, I'm not, I'm not going to name names, but you can certainly hear um, singers that, that are, that experience uh, a diminution of their skills as as they get older and maybe it's not quite as repeatable and also lifestyle factors into this um, and how well they take care of themselves there's also neurological issues that can that can affect the voice so um i don't uh, the ones that have the least repeatable vocals are the ones that are that are pushing their voice to the extreme um not taking care of themselves, um, maybe genetically um, aren't, the voice isn't able to handle what they're pushing it through. Um, often taking the chest voice too high, getting too shouty, uh, things like that. Hey, Stewie, how you doing? Let me see. Yeah, so Stewie, if you're practicing softly, yes, you can get better. There are there are different ways to do this, all right? Um, first, this is a wonderful way to do this. Uh, secondly, there's something called a belt box. I've got mine somewhere. And it's essentially, it looks like just like a large um, respirator type of mask that you just put over that you can sing into. Um, these also kind of serve the same purpose. So you can you can belt into this and the straw is gonna give you some resistance. This is handy, this is at voicestraw.com. Um, again, you can do those little, oh, I'm sorry. How smooth can you get that? Keeping that little cry, little edgy sound. Uh, mental practice is great. 
to just really think, and I mean really think and experience it in your mind of singing really well. They have found, they've done studies where people um, think about lifting weights and they actually build some muscle mass. Now, that having been said, um, being able to then do things at performance volume, of course, is is great to have as part of your practice. You can look into um, a vocal booth. Um, there are some, you can get plans to build one yourself. I don't think it's too expensive to build one. You don't have to get like a whisper room. Those are really expensive. But um, I got a vocal booth. Um, it, if, if it's really, really hot, I've got it in the garage. Um, on really, really warm days, it gets warm in the booth pretty quick, but I can go in there and just uh, let it fly. And, and you can break those down for when you move as well. So you can also look into that. But yes, practicing softly has a lot of advantages. Um, let me see. It's not damaging to your voice box where you have to constantly be having surgery on your on your voice. So any surgery carries risks. Um, they've gotten better at the surgeries, but look, you you have this this very thin layer, the the outer covering of the the vocal folds. Um, it's like this gelatinous collagen type of material. And this is incredibly important for allowing vibration, right? Because as we get further down into the vocal fold, we get into muscle and ligament. And the muscle and ligament, if we didn't have this soft outer covering, that's not going to buzz. It's, it's too hard. So, and this, this is, it doesn't regenerate. It doesn't grow back. So as you're, as you're damaging your voice and, and leaving scar tissue and having surgery, if you're losing a little bit of that, that, that's the risk of having surgery. Surgery should always be a last resort. And they don't tend to, I think there may be, I just know of a couple of doctors who will espouse this, but they don't do surgery for nodules anymore. Nodules are more like a, a callus. They will need to do them for polyps, which is more like a, a fluid-filled blister um, because those will just leave loose skin, so they do have to trim that away. <laughs> but it's usually vocal rest um, that's going to give you um, the best benefit. Yeah, Amy, can I recommend anything for cooling down after a performance? Fantastic question. Do a warm-up in reverse. So the idea of a cool down is you've, you've really worked this voice and what you don't want to do is then just go into not talking and then go, say going to bed because you want to stretch everything out so, this, so the voice doesn't kind of get tight overnight. So I would work from, you know, glides on narrow vowels. Or, um, or, uh, things like that. Um, and then you can also straws again, this and glides from your lower to upper register are really, really good. You just want to really stretch everything. It's just about stretching everything and easing everything. Um, and then, so I would, I would start with the narrow vowels, do some scales, do some glides, keep it nice and gentle, and then go to the semi, <coughs> excuse me, the semi occluded, whether it's straws, a straw and water, etc. Do I have a good uh, mixed voice now as I get older? Is it purely a falsetto? No, I mean, I can, so I can go through, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be falsetto, right? You're, you're, it, as you get older, it's not that you have to sing in falsetto. Um, as you get older, your voice will start to become a little less, less flexible. So, uh, so in the male voice, as you get older, you're going to start to lose some testosterone. 
you can get a little bit of weakness in the vocal folds. You can get a little bit of bowing. That's why, you know, kind of the stereotypical old man voice tends to sound like that, right? There's there's bowing and the, and the pitch goes higher. The female voice begins to lose uh, estrogen. There's a little more testosterone. So the voice starts to um, become a little lower. Um, there's a little less flexibility. So it's, you just have to um, work the voice more. Um, but uh, no, I do find if, I, if I'm not practicing all the time, um, my voice is a little less forgiving, that's for sure. Yeah, so Amy, steaming your voice when it's really tired, would you recommend putting anything in the water, please? This is a great question. If you are using a steamer, anything you put in the water is not going to go into the steam. Um, so that what you want, okay? You can get these on Amazon. They're like 40 bucks. I would get the ones um, with the rechargeable batteries inside and you get this saline solution. This is a mesh nebulizer, all right? I have, I have a couple of these and I, I keep them wherever, I have them up here in my studio and then I also have them in my vocal booth. And what this does is it takes the saline solution and turns it into this mist and the mist, the um, very, very fine droplets. And this carries the saline into the mist. So this is the best way to put moisture directly on your folds. They have done studies. Um, steam, it's better than nothing, but it's this is much more efficient um, and will stay on your vocal folds longer. It's a mesh nebulizer. That's what you want. And then you just get this sterile saline solution. This is cheap on Amazon. This stuff, I think it, you get a hundred of these vials of these individual vials for under $20. And so I would use that. Um, I'd also, I'm a fan of if you're in a very dry environment, um, using a humidifier um, in your sleeping environment. It's also, as we're moving into winter here in the Northern hemisphere, <clears throat> also germs like dry air, they're able to float around better when it's when it's uh, moist air they they can't float around and get you as sick um so i recommend that also just just hydration staying well hydrated i also use um something called guafenesin um i never remember how to spell this but guafenesin is the active ingredient in Mucinex. You can buy it cheap. It's generic. Um, it's an extract of tree bark. I think they synthesize it now. You can look it up, ask your doctor. It appears to be uh, safe. I take one every day, but again, I'm not a doctor, so check with your doctor. But if you deal with phlegm, that will thin out the mucus. Um, it's very effective for that. The aging voice as you get older, that's going to be one of the issues, is going to be phlegm and mucus. And so I have found that incredibly helpful along with a nebulizer and staying hydrated. Yeah. Um, so some singers get better as they get older. Yeah, Dave Matthews' voice coach is actually um, a friend of mine, Rob Stevenson. And I've, I've actually given Rob some lessons. He's, he's an amazing singer. He's a vocal arranger. Um, he goes on the road with Dave. And he also works um, with Justin Timberlake. His partner, who, who teaches with him, is Mindy Pack. Mindy is the creator of these voice straws. So as the voice, look, if you take care of the voice, um, as the voice ages, it will get richer. And, and there is a period as you begin to get older where, where the voice, you know, the, the voice when you're a baby, uh, the reason they can scream all night is because this collagen material, there's, there's more of it. And so it's like they have boxing gloves on. And then that begins to, to thin out and, the, and also the vocal folds begin to get stronger. So as you get uh, older, the voice, you begin to have more power, more resistance um, in the vocal folds. Now, you also lose a little bit of flexibility. And at a certain point, 
this this um, stiffening of the vocal folds is not necessarily an advantage. However, you can sing with a little more power, a little more robustness, robustness, a little more richness um, in the chest voice. You always have to deal with the instrument that you have in the here and now. And I, I, when I train voice teachers, I talk about them dealing with the voice of the moment. What is the voice doing right now? What is happening in this moment with the voice? And your voice is changing all the time, year to year. I mean, decade to decade, year to year, day to day, hour to hour. Have you had proper rest? Are you stressed? Are you hydrated? Did you just eat? All of these things affect the voice. Um, so yeah, there is um, there are benefits to the voice maturing. Yeah, Bob Dylan. You know, but uh, I, I gotta say about Bob Dylan, he people seem to hold him up as, hey, you don't have to be a great singer. Look at Bob Dylan because he's just an artist. Um, Bob Dylan's a great singer. He just is. And Bob Dylan, no one can sing his material like he does. And I mean, you listen to him on, on those. I mean, he certainly had his sound and his style. It's, it's deceptive because it's, it's so approachable and kind of folksy and, and he doesn't like hold technique in, in your face. It's like great actors that you don't realize are acting. Um, is how I view Bob Dylan. Let me see. Yeah, so when you're talking about Lou Graham, Robert Plant, Freddie Mercury, they have the ability to switch between falsetto and baritone. You can't really tell the difference between their head voice and chest voice. So the, these... The, look, all singers are going to have like different gears of their voice. And sometimes you want to purposefully make the voice sound um falsetto you know when freddie's somebody too right when he goes to that ooh doo, i'm not sure what pitch he's on but he goes really falsetto on on that on purpose um but yeah they're they're just they're great voices that can that can blend the registers and that's really most of your work your technical work as a singer, beyond your musicianship and your expression, emotional connection, performance, all of these things, a lot of your technical work is learning to blend registers. That, that's where the work is. And that's what a good voice teacher is going to show you how to do. Max Hit, what are some singing technique topics that you've changed your mind on in the last few years? This is a great question, man. Um, I've really, really changed. I've changed my mind on on imagery, and yeah, using imagery and cueing. I, when I was was trained as a voice teacher, and when I was taking lessons, it was very much cause and effect, <laughs> so that everything that is happening in the voice is is the process of some primary function and you're always just balancing here right it's just it's all here but more and more i realize a lot of it's here and that that imagery is actually very very powerful and there was in older techniques there was a lot of imagery and then there was a bit of a backlash against that and i think where the 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 backlash may have had a point was a lot of times the imagery was imposed by the teacher upon the student and but they threw the baby out with the bathwater and imagery is actually quite powerful but i feel that if it comes from the student and the student starts to make these connections um it can really really help so for instance in my voice one of the challenges that i've encountered in the last couple of years is that i've i have a vocal tremor, which is a neurological um, issue that they're not sure why it occurs. But what happens is the voice can be a little shaky. E -e 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 -e. And if I just don't do anything about it, that that's what will happen in my voice. But 
if I use imagery and I just feel the energy of the voice above radiating down and I and I imagine this expansion almost like the the head of the of a drum being tightened so that the vocal folds are expanding this way rather than this because my body wants to squeeze in order to to assist I can get wee 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 rather than and so I feel that energy radiating from above. So that's that's helped a lot. Also, um, screaming techniques. That used to be voice teachers would just say, don't do that. My, I remember my teachers never even try that. There's no way to do it healthy. And as a matter of fact, as so many um, teachers are proving that specialize in this, you can absolutely do it healthy. It's not the vocal folds that are making um, the noise element. There are other parts of the vocal tract that are involved. So um, you can do that healthy. Amy, you are welcome. Yeah, I will check out Jacob Collier. I've got to do that. Um, how, how serious um, is the no smoking rule for singing re really? Um, so, Stewie, they, they don't have firm data on this. And, and this, is, this is completely anecdotal, yeah? But I, I know a very, very prominent ear, nose, and throat doctor who specializes in performers, singers, and and treat some really high profile singers. Has a, works with a lot of voice teachers, sending them students. And um, this voice teacher did an endoscopy of a of a patient, and then the patient who doesn't regularly smoke went and and smoked some weed and came back the next day and the voice doctor saw visual inflammation and irritation on the folds. Now, that's not a long-term study. Um, that's a, a study of one, so, but, and I, I think more should be looked into, but, but you have to just consider that you are, and, and the, voice, the voice is sensitive. Yeah, but but they're also seeing that 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 voice damage as they're looking, the, the voice will recover, right? Unless you're severely damaging that that outer layer. But you, you it's dragging smoke across it. And so if it's if it's chronic, it can it can be it could be arguably problematic. I recommend um for singers um edibles. I know that's not the same exact same experience and you got to be um, careful with edibles, but they high quality edibles now. I mean, you can really be precise on the dosing because um, that can be a problem with edibles that you don't get with smoking is you can overdo it. Right. And you, you want to wait a couple of hours. Uh, you know, the mistake people make is they'll wait an hour and go, oh, I don't feel anything. And then they'll double the dose and then an hour later they're in trouble but yeah it it it, it can be an issue yeah that's interesting so if you have students performing in clubs with lots of smoking that's not an issue here in the u.s anymore but i will tell you from my club days man i will never forget performing in this uh, club um, that in a, in a nice hotel by an airport. And the stage had a low ceiling and then there, the, the stage kind of went out and there was seating that like a bar that came, that sat right on the stage. So people could sit there. And I remember this group of businessmen came and they sat down, man, and they put their cigarette packs down, boom. And they basically chain smoked nonstop for a couple of hours. It was like fog machines going off. 
And every time coming home from gigs, I would stink of smoke. There was the smell of smoke in my cymbals. And I sang through it. Um, secondhand smoke, obviously, now we know, uh, can be dangerous. But the bottom line is you, you cannot control that environment. You can't. You can maybe get like a really good HEPA air filter on the stage. Um, I would use a nebulizer. I'd just drink lots of water and hydrate. And, you know, you just, you just got to muscle through those, through those gigs. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, that's why, that's why they basically eliminated smoking in, in places here because they're, you know, the staff of these places were just subjected to lots of smoke. And, and the accompanying health issues. So you, you're talking about great singers. The question is great singers who are able to um, go through the registers, blend them all without training. That is, that exists, right? There are people who have the the just this mind-body connection where they're able to figure it out. Look, people think that that voice lessons are this special thing and the not taking voice lessons are completely removed from each other. And they're not. All voice lessons are is it's just somebody in real time to guide you. You still have to steer the ship. They're just guiding you and giving you suggestions helping you figure this out. But there are people who figure it out on their own. And some of them figure it out pretty well. Some of them figure it out amazingly well. So it's, it's not that you have to have voice lessons. I will say, look, all of these singers practiced. They practiced. That's all a voice teacher is doing, you, doing for you is showing you how to practice efficiently. The fastest way to get better at singing, the number one thing that if I could give you anything, any gift to be able to learn how to sing is knowing what to work on and knowing how to do it correctly. And if you figure that out through imitation, through just natural ability, through having just a little more sensitivity and awareness, fantastic. Singers, you really need to work on your mind-body awareness. If you're going to do this by yourself, great. But you really have to get in touch with what you're feeling, where you feel the vibrations, when you feel that it's going to be too much or too little. Steve Perry talked about, now Steve Perry was in choir, but Steve Perry didn't really have formal lessons. He get, He learned some stuff in choir and the teacher would show him things and Steve Perry would go work on it. And he always, his guide was, does this feel easy? He'd always be looking for what's an easier way to do this? What would take less effort? And that is incredibly intuitive. And, and Steve Perry just worked it, worked it, worked it, worked it. So what is the difference between Steve Perry doing that or a voice teacher going, hey, Here's a way that you can do this easier. It, it's, it, it's not completely separate from each other. People have a misconception. They, they, they over-romanticize people who don't take lessons, that somehow there was just some magic star that came upon them and the, the vocal gods just blessed them. Now look, there is, there is some genetic blessings that that's truly extraordinary voices will have, but they also have within those blessings, a work ethic, a focus, an ability to really listen and discern, an ability to know what to work on, a, an ability to understand their voice, an ability to really go inward and connect and not just practice things mindlessly, just thinking if I do this 10,000 times, it'll get better. No, they're always working on how can I do this better? So let me see. 
Yeah, you know what, Stewie? So, so growling and how to do it healthy. Um, that's really not my expertise, man. Go check out um, Tony uh, Linke, or is it Link? Uh, T O N I L I N K uh, E. And he's he's a young voice teacher who's really really good at this. He's got stuff on YouTube. Um, he's really smart. He's really good at this. Go go learn it from the people who who know what they're doing. It's just it's not my specialty. So uh, let's see, Julia. Nice to meet you, Julia. You oh, thank you. That's that's very kind. Singer and a choir master, fantastic. Um, how I would recommend teaching a non-professional a cappella choir of eight. What's this word here? I don't even know if I. I'm going to show my to Cantiana. I, I'm really sorry. I don't know that word. So um, I'll, I'll try and answer best I can. If you can, if you can tell me what that term means. Sorry about that. Uh, hey Garfield, how you doing? So um, yeah, it is um, Acapella, man, I really recommend Rob Dietz's book, Acapella 101. He's he's just got a, a wonderful um, resource there. Rob is um, a student. I've actually worked with Rob. He's fantastic. And, and Rob is a vocal arranger. Um, he's um, arranged for uh, TV shows. Um, he's absolutely fantastic. And um, he works alongside Ben Bram, who I've also worked with, I've, I've had the pleasure of teaching at their, their a cappella um, summer program. And Ben is the an arranger for Pentatonix. Uh, ben has produced for them. He's just absolutely brilliant. My gosh, I worked with Ben when he was in college. And um, he was uh, the music director for the a cappella group at USC, and they won the national championship um, How he was when he was doing that. So let me see. I'm going to Google this. Everyone, give me a second. I need to move this software out of the way. Yeah, I'm not sure what I'm. If you could, Julia, just just tell me what you mean by that term. I wonder, let me just see. Oh, let me see. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so in a smooth lyrical style. Thank you. So what so what issues, let me just ask you, what issues are they having that that's kind of stopping them from being able to do this style? Um, are they are they straining at certain parts? Um do you, are they getting a little heavy, say around F, F sharp, G above middle C? Are they, are they flipping? So just, just a little bit more information on that. I'll see if I can help you. Um, so uh, my voice, yeah, I seem to when I was younger, my voice has always been tricky because I could... Um, it's a bigger voice, so I could access I could access higher notes. I think it my the best I ever did was soprano above high C, um, but that's of course in falsetto. Oh, I can almost get that B flat, um, but no, I I I've had to to learn to be able to switch back and forth, and I I still work on it. You never stop working on this this switching back and forth. And, and some days you're going to be better than others. Um, but to work this switching back and forth, you've got to do it every day. And you've got to find exercises that are going to be helpful in order to do it. The best exercise that I found for people, I love the B of book. That B is going to, is going to help stabilize the larynx because it's usually the larynx coming up and it's not, it's not necessarily that a higher larynx is bad, but it's why is it coming up? And it's usually coming up because we're trying to drive 
the lower resonance too high. Ba 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 ba. Go into that shout condition. If you just give me book, you can you can start smoothing out that break and make sure you keep that vowel. Uh, uh, don't allow. It's going to want to do that. But if you really focus on the uh, you can start really smoothing out that break. Yeah, you know what, Julia? So really, really developing this sense of legato, I would have them speak the lyrics and really talk in this connected type of voice and practice just going from vowel to vowel. So get them to talk. It kind of sounds like a like an early um, speech synthesis uh, robot. But get them to feel the connections from word to word to word and then have them work a small sections of the song. Remove all the consonants. Just go from vowel to vowel to vowel, uninterrupted, and really have them focus on the experience of shifting from vowel to vowel, what that feels like how they feel, wait, wait, where do I feel the more narrow vowels? And as the vowel opens, and am I gonna feel a little more uh, of a pull? Can I, can I make that blend from vowel to vowel? Um, and then bring back in the consonants while you, while you get the, the dictation. Timing, timing is a really interesting thing. This is, this is a really, really key for singers, is timing. Um, because it's something that we don't tend to drill on our instruments. And I really suggest that singers uh, work with a metronome and really drill quarter notes and, and whole notes. Let me see if I've got one here on my phone. So if I take a metronome, If everyone can hear that. And then the idea is I want this to disappear. Right? If I'm a little late, you'll hear the metronome. So you clap to where you cannot hear it. And then start working eights. Right? You can slow it down a little bit and start working 16th. And then you can you can take it a little faster, make clap and make it disappear. Then you can start taking it slower and make it disappear, which is harder. But singers really need to start really feeling rhythm and the subdivisions of rhythm. They've really got to feel, right? Those quarters, those eighths, sixteenths, right? Triplets. So that they can start to feel swing. Um, that's incredibly, incredibly important. Oh, so, um, Stewie, you're going to get a piano. You know what? I will tell you, man, the the digital pianos are getting, are getting pretty good. Um, I would make sure, right. You get a little bit of, I think it's worth it to have, at, you got to have touch sensitivity, right? Because the really cheap ones, no matter how hard or soft you press it, it's going to be the same volume. So you're not going to get that feel. Um, also, it, it can be worth it to get weighted keys. So it feels like you've got a bit of that resistance. Um, what I find fascinating about this piano, this is a Yamaha P121. And if I, if I just lean and press down on these keys, if I hit one, I can hear it it um, ring. And so they're they're starting to actually create like the sympathetic vibrations. You don't need to go that far. But um, yeah, just just start getting piano under your fingers. I, I do that in my voice school. I have um, I created a whole piano course for teachers. And I thought, no, you know what, this will work for singers who want to be able to play the, the 
practice the scales and and work themselves and then learn how to accompany off chord charts and do songs so i put that in my voice school i think i think it's a great thing to have You see, we work a lot on clear beat. Okay, I feel that they're not continuing lyrical passages like we should be. Maybe from the concert work with Metronome. All right, okay. And there's also, you got to make, you. Uh, sometimes if singers aren't efficient with their breath um, and they feel like they're running out of air, they may rush things, they may get breathy, they may drop things. Um, you can even just practice, you know, keeping them on an on an ooh vowel and just practicing all swell coming back down, swells coming back down. I'm sure you do all that. Um, a lot of that also is singers as they get better in a group setting. When they're first singing, they're focused on themselves. It's all about okay, I've got to get this note. Am I doing this right? But then with experience, they start to focus on everyone around them and less and less on themselves. And that's the mark of a really good um, performer. Even when they're singing solo, they're focused more on the music around them and the audience and the energy rather than uh, just their technique. So it becomes uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, let me see, Anthony, you watch a lot of vocal coaches. They Say switching can actually save your voice in the long run from long-term vocal damage. Are they lying? So they're, no, no, I don't think anybody on YouTube's lying. I, I don't attack other voice teachers on YouTube. I, I think that's that's just a terrible trend that, that some people choose to do. Absolutely not. No one's lying. Everybody is, is on there. Um, hold on, I got to plug in my computer. Everyone's on there doing their best to help giving the best information that they have in the way that they explain it. <clears throat> what they are likely saying is just not dragging pure chest up. There ha you, you have to switch, right? <clears throat> but is the switch noticeable or is the switch smooth? That's the difference. So if it's, if it's noticeable, then the audience can hear it. Now, maybe that's an effect you want, but if you're avoiding switching and you're just pushing your chest as high as you can, that can be very, very heavy on the voice. So legato and portamento. So portamento is when you're actually, right? Legato would be portamento would be it's the slide. You want to be careful with those. You, you don't want that to be a habit that you're uh, not aware of when you're singing, but portamentos can be these slides. These vocal glides can be great. They're really, really helpful. Um, I really like those. We also work on, on scales where there's specific notes, but what's wonderful about glides is you don't have to worry about notes. Sometimes when we're trying to get the note, we'll tense up on each note. So they just... helpful and really good um, for the voice. So since you've played both drums and guitar, which is more energy depleting when it comes to your singing and playing the instrument at the same time? So I never, I, I play guitar for fun professionally, right? Getting paid to perform. The only instrument I got paid to do um, was the drums. I've done some more. I've, I've sung and played piano, but, but drums by far was the instrument that I was, that I was uh, best at. Um, I was actually a, a pretty good drummer. I mean, I could still play drums. You have to stay on top of the voice more than, than I do on that. I mean, I'm not going to play like I did all those years ago, but I could still play. However, drums, depending on the, the music you're doing, it, it takes a lot of energy. But I was actually, I could play drums and sing at the same time, no problem, because I, I'd spent so much time working at the drums that it was on autopilot. Um, yeah, Stu, if you want to invest wisely on one, um, you can't go wrong with Yamaha. I will tell you that. They're just uh, absolutely fantastic. Let me see. I'm going to have to wrap it up here really quick because I've got a lesson 
uh, that I've got to go teach coming up. Uh, how often should you change up the warm up? It, it works for you. You know what? If something's working for you, especially in the warm up phase, I, I wouldn't worry too much about changing it where once the voice is warmed up, that's where you want to be kind of maybe challenging the voice with different things. If it's, if it's working for you, it feels healthy and it gets you ready to sing. Uh, I'm not too worried about it. The only I think downside if you for people not changing it up is is if they start doing it mindlessly. You want to always be always be in the moment, always be focused. Don't be distracted. Get get the distractions out of your your practice area. Get the phone out of there. Um, just really be focused on on your voice. Um, let me see. Oh, I've frozen. I have. I don't know what that's about. Huh. I apologize for that. All right. So my, my picture's frozen. I'm going to have to leave here in a second. But but uh, let me see. Julia, I will answer this last question. Your goal as a voice teacher and as a choir master is to learn and teach, is to listen. Yeah, people don't know how to listen. They do not Yeah, you're right. You're right. So listening is is absolutely is absolutely essential. Um, and you need to learn how to listen, and you need to learn how to. Wow, I look very very concerned on my frozen picture. Um, you need to learn how to listen. I think it's when I plugged in my computer. Uh, learn how to listen and and get that. Also, what are you feeling? What are you experiencing? Um, I love this one voice teacher, uh, Chris Lipe, uh, shared with me. Um, he's good at teaching screaming. He's on YouTube, very successful. Um, but he gets like these great smelling soaps and he will just spend time washing his hands and just feeling the soap and smelling it and experiencing it. Getting into the mind-body connection is absolutely um, powerful. Lucy Phillips, so good to see you. How are you doing? Uh, me with my frozen picture. All right, everyone. I want to uh, thank you so much and uh, I will... Talk to you next week.